شهد الله أنه لا إله إلا هو والملائكة والملائكة وأولو العلم قائما بالقسط لا إله إلا هو العزيز الحكيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين إن شاء الله تعالى Today we'll be going through a poem by a sheikh known as Sheikh Abd Rahman Nasir Saadi rahimahullah and his poem is known as As Sayru ila Allah wa Dar al Akhirah It's known as the journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the home of the hereafter or Ami the hereafter translated as okay now so this poem it's about 18 lines yeah and it's not very long uh, it's quite short so we will, it won't take too long for us to finish maybe two sessions one until asr and then maybe about an hour after asr now this poem what it talks about is traits and characteristics of the righteous believer um, the person we should aspire to be the type of person we should be Right, um, the type of mindset we should have, how our relationship with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala should be, um, how we should be both inwardly and outwardly. Okay, so the Sheikh Rahimahullah he starts off by saying, "Sa'id al-Ladina tajannabu subul al-Rada wa tayammu li manazil al-Ridwan." Sa'id, fortunate and pleased, al-Ladina are those tajannabu, those that have yani. Made far from themselves, subul al rada, the paths of destruction, shall we say? What and have directed themselves and intended to go towards manazil al rudwani, the stations of the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So within this first line of poetry, the Sheikh Rahimahullah, he is somewhat praising and talking about the pleasure. And um, the reality that the pious person is within, right? Where they remove themselves from any type of path that will lead them away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلَ As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. And this is my path, the upright path, right? Do not follow any of these other paths that will lead you astray. The path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one path. And you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described all of the other paths as subul and he didn't describe it as a sabil. He described them as paths. But this, the, the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. And we'll get towards it yani, into more detail as we go through the poem, inshaAllah ta'ala. وَتَيَمَّمُوا And they have made their goal and their only direction and the one thing that they want in life, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The whole goal is the hereafter. Right, they see this life as a journey, and what are they doing in this life? They are increasing in what is known as azad provisions that will help you reach the end of your journey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He says in the Quran, And increase in zad. What is zad in the Arabic language? Zad is known as what you would take with your with you when you're about to go on a journey, right. Food, drink, clothing, things that will help you survive on your journey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَزَوَّدُوا And increase in what? Increase in provisions. وَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَى And the best of the provisions are what? At-taqwa. Why? Because based on your level of taqwa, it will determine what you will receive in the hereafter. If you were a person who had no taqwa at all and disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll be from the people of the hellfire. If you were a person who had a low level of taqwa, you may not necessarily receive the highest levels of Jannah. If you were a person who tried their best and strove as much as they could, bi'idhnillah ta'ala, you'll be from the people of the highest levels of Jannah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from them. So the Shaykh rahimahullah, he goes on to describe what they do. He said, فَهُمُ الَّذِينَ أَخْلَصُوا فِي مَشِّهِمْ مُتَشَرِّعِينَ بِشِرْعَةِ الْإِيمَانِ فَهُمُ الَّذِينَ They are those أَخْلَصُوا They are sincere فِي مَشِّهِمْ In their going about. يعني, what does that mean? In their going about of their daily activities. In their going about in, in their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And things that 
um, relate to what will affect their relationship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from acts of worship, from staying away from sins, from how they deal with others. Why? Because the way you deal with others can either have a positive effect on the relationship between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or it can have a negative effect, right? Why? Because if you're a person who oppresses people, takes their rights, curses them, abuses them, that will... يعني, inwardly that will have a, a, a direct effect on your iman Why? Because you're a person who's falling into sin Not only, not only are you transgressing against the, 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 uh, that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram right? You Not only are you sinning against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala But you are taking up a right of a fellow believer And know that these sins are worse than the sins that are considered to be Between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Why? Because when you commit a sin like that not only do you have to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you have to try and give that person's right back. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he describes the muflis. He describes the one who is bankrupt, right? He, so he said to the sahaba radiallahu anhu, do you know who the one who is bankrupt? And obviously the way they understood bankruptcy was a person who has no wealth. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no, it's a person who will come on the day of judgment Right? Uh, a person who cursed this person, a person who spilled the blood of this person, the person who stole from this person. Yeah, he took all of these people's rights. And on the, on the day of judgment, they will come and they will take their they will take their right back. But in what form? They will take it from your good deeds. To the extent where if your good deeds are complete and you don't have any more good deeds left, they will start to offload their sins onto you. That's why it's so dangerous for you to oppress another person, steal, backbite, um, slander, uh, stir things up, you know. Um, the Prophet ﷺ, he went past a grave one day and he said, That these two people in these graves are being punished. And they're not being punished in something that you may not necessarily see to be something big, right? One of them, he explained that it was a person that would not clean themselves from urine. And he said, and the third is Kana Yamshi bin Namima. The second person is a person who would Yamshi bin Namima. What is a Namima? A Namima is when you you carry news in between people and you stir things up and you يعني, you make a situation a lot worse than it actually is, right? Where you go to this person and you say, Oh, so and said said this. And then you carry that and you carry it to the other person. So it's if you're carrying tales. Right? And this is this is a grave, grave sin. So, the Shaykh Rahimahullah, he says they are sincere in their going about, their, they are sincere in their worship, in their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the way that they, uh, the way that they conduct themselves, right, is not in accordance to their whims, it's not in accordance, the way they conduct themselves is not in accordance to their whims, nor is it in accordance to their desires. It's in accordance to the what? To the sharia or that we have, that which was revealed to the Prophet wasallam, the Quran and the Sunnah. Now, one thing you need to know, and this relates to acts of worship. When it comes to al-ibadah, right? When it comes to worship, what is the meaning of worship, right? What is the meaning of worship? Worship can have a certain meaning if we're talking about the acts of worship and then worship can also have a certain meaning if we're talking about the haqiqah of al-ibadah the reality of worship itself so the reality of worship itself is a tadallul right it's um utter and it's it's tadallul lillahi ta'ala if we want to say worship to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a tadallul lillahi ta'ala right it's utter and complete tadallul uh, humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the highest level of love and the highest level of glorification this is the reality of worship these acts of worship you are doing are manifestations of this thing right it's where you are doing it with number one out of a complete level of humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sujood is a perfect a perfect example of that when you place the most noble parts on your body on the ground, which is your يعني, your face and your forehead. You place that on the ground for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It shows that you are in a, such a state of humility, you are prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? 
You do out of the highest level of love. Why? Because the highest level of love is for no one except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you do it out of the highest level of glorification. Because this is solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, what about acts of worship? What are acts of worship? We know what the reality of worship is. What are, what are considered to be acts of worship? An act of worship, as Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he has a kitab known as al-Ubudiyyah. In this book, he gave a definition of what an act of worship is. He said that it's ismun jami'un li kulli ma yuhibbuhu allahu wa yardahu min al-aqwali wal-af'ali al-zahira wal-batina. It's anything anything that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves whether it's actions or statements these actions can be outward actions such as salah zakah hajj umrah right or they can be inner actions such as a tawakkul dependence upon allah subhanahu wa ta'ala husnul dhanni billah having good thoughts of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the love of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Right? When you love someone for the sake of Allah, that's an inwardly act of worship. Right? Hope. Right? Uh, which is al-raja. These are all acts of worship that are inner acts of worship. And we'll get to, uh, later on, the Shaykh Rahimullah, he kind of uh, touches on that. And we'll get to that, inshallah ta'ala. So, now, when it comes to acts of worship, there are two things that without these two things, no act of worship will ever be accepted. You always have to have these two things in place. Number one is al-ikhlas, sincerity. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept any act of worship that's not done solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was sent to the disbelievers of Quraysh, was he sent to them to tell them to believe in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, they already ex they already believed in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They they already believed and they had like a general, somewhat of a general belief in many aspects of the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They knew Allah was the creator, the sustainer, the provider. But what would they do? They would direct their acts of worship to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent to them um, to call them to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to purify them from all the other acts of shirk that they would do, whether it was related to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it was related to the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or whether it was related to the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the, the main issue that they had was with worship. They would direct their worship to Allah, wal Uzza, and all of these other idols that they would create, right? And it would be their, their worship would be so ridiculous to the extent where if they didn't have any type of idol to worship, they would create it from maybe dates or something like that, and then they would worship that. But when they would get hungry, what would they do? They would end up eating um, the statue that they made. Yani how, how ridiculous is that? Right? You direct your worship to, 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 to a thing that you have made, and once, once you get hungry, you end up eating it? Completely foolish, right? So, number one, you have to be sincere in your worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, it needs to be done in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he say? He said, Man amina amalan, amalan, laysa alayhi amruna rad. Any act of worship that's not done in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's not accepted, it's rejected, right? We can't come and come up with any type of worship that we want or um, specify or today I want to feel I feel good, so I want to pray six rakaat for dhuhr instead of four. You can't do that. Why? Because the Sharia and ibadat they have been specified in the Quran and the Sunnah. And the best way to do it is the way the best of creation did it. Was the Prophet, which was the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So if we come about now and we try and add things into the religion, what does that mean? That means what? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't do his job properly as a prophet, right? He didn't, he didn't give us the message properly. But the Prophet, uh, يعني, that's impossible. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was not taken and he was, يعني, his soul was not taken until he completed his job and completed his, mesh, his mission as a messenger. Salawatullahi wa salamahu alayhi. Now, um, يعني, that's some of the most important points that relate to worship. We'll move on to the, to the next line of poetry. 
And he says, they are those who mulladina banaw manazila sayrihim bayna raja wal khawfi liddayyani. Right? They are those who they have built يعني, their stations in terms of their journey, right? They have built their stations in between what? And in, يعني, in reality, their act of worship. Bayna raja between hope wal khawf and fear. Liddayyani, يعني, lilhakim, the one who will... Um, reward them and يعني, will judge them being like ta'ala on the day of judgment so the, the when it comes to their acts of worship and their relationship with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's in between the hope for the mercy of allah and the reward of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the fear and the puni- fear of the punishment of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the wrath of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they're not too too يعني, uh, tilted towards one side nor are they too tilted towards the other side. The ulama, rahimahumullah, they would say, Man abad Allah bil khawfi wahdahu fahu haruriyun. Whoever worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone with fear, then he is like the khawarij, right? Which were a sect who came out and did many evil things. They spilt blood and they were, they were a very bloodthirsty sect, as the, يعني, probably the best way to, to describe them, right? Woman abad Allah. Whoever worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with hope only, then he is considered to be from the murjia. The murjia were also another sect who would not see the actions are from iman. يعني, and a, a perfect example of today's time, in today's time, is where people will do as many sins as they want, right? But then yet they say iman is in the heart. Iman is in the heart. They don't pray, they don't fast, they don't do their zakah. Um, they do as many sins as they want, but yet they say Iman is in the heart. Yani, of course, Iman is in the heart, but Iman is, there's talazum, there's, there's, there's a relationship between the heart and the limbs. There's a relationship between your heart and, and your body and your mindset and the way you think, right? If you're a believer, yani, if you're a believer who truly believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way you should, yani, as a believer, you would try your best to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You would try your best to what? To be grateful for everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. You would try your best to, if you do end up falling into sins, to repent back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because you know Allah is the most merciful and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always accept your repentance. Right? Will always forgive you for your sins. But how do you claim to be a believer and a true believer when you don't care about a salah? Right? You don't care about the fasting in the month of Ramadan. You don't care about paying your zakah. Yani in reality, do you really fear the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do you really, have you really comprehended the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within yani, a blink of an eye can remove you from this life and put you into a tormenting punishment? And you have no control over, uh, over it at all. You can't get yourself out. You can't stop it. You have no control at all. A true believer, he has hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, has, he, he reads and understands and uh, wholeheartedly applies himself when he sees these verses that talk about the, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how Allah uh, wants khair for his creation. And on top of that, he doesn't allow that to feel like he's safe from the punishment of Allah. Right? He knows that the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is severe. And those that are deserving of it will be punished severely. So he's in the middle, right? He's within these two things, the hope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and um, the, uh, the the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember we mentioned something about acts of worship and this somewhat applies more towards the hope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the acts of worship that are considered to be a, um, a inwardly inner act of worship one of the actions of the heart is something known as husnul dhanni billah ta'ala right and this is one of the greatest acts of worship and this will not only have a positive effect on your worship but it will have a positive effect on your worldly life right allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a hadith in qudsi okay, let me translate husnul dhan husnul dhan afwan husnul dhan means having positive thoughts of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala think about thinking about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a positive way so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said in a hadith in qudsi and a hadith qudsi is a hadith where the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said right that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said 
أنا عندي ظني عبدي بي فليظن بي ما شاء إن ظن بي خيرا فله وإن ظن بي شرا فله That I am what my servant thinks of me If my servant thinks of me in a positive way Then that is how I will be with him or with her يعني what does that mean? If you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always help you, will always accept your dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always wants khair for you, no matter what happens to you in life, bi-idhnillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-hakim, the most wise, and everything happens for a, we- for, for a reason, and everything happens in accordance to the wisdom and the perfect wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And eventually things will come out to be the best for me. It may not necessarily sometimes be what I want, but it may... It will be bi idhnillah ta'ala what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for me bi idhnillah will be the best. يعني, and you have this type of mindset, right? This is how your life will be. You will live a positive life, you will live a blissful life, you will live a fruitful life. Why? Because you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala number one wants khair for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always wants to, I mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to bestow you with his blessings and will accept your repentance if you repent to him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to shower his mercy upon you. Then this is how your life will be. Allah will bless you with many blessings in this life and in the hereafter. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala carries on to say, And if this person thinks about me in a negative way, then that is how it will be for that person. Meaning if you think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a negative way, and you think that Allah never wants to help you, subhanahu wa ta'ala, life is always against you. Why is it always me, Right? And you think, on earth, nothing good ever happens to me. Then this is how your life will be. You will live a life of misery. No khair will come to you. Why? Because you're not thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a positive way. And that will in return have a negative effect on your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does a person then feel like when they're worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? When they're praying their salah, when they're doing their fasting. If they feel like, oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never accepts my dua. That's a, it's, it's a terrible mindset and it's a very, very dangerous mindset to have. It's a very dangerous mindset. And it's a mindset that you as a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is يعني, from the sharia and from Islam, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, he said, and he said this three days before he died, as Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu mentioned. لا يموتنا أحدكم إلا هو يحسن بربه الظن. Right? None of you should die Except that you have good thoughts of your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you as a Muslim should always have good thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, who was from the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ He said, I swear by the one who my soul is in his hands. مَا أُعْطِيَ عَبْدٌ شَيْئًا خَيْرًا مِنْ حُسْنِ ظَنِّي بِاللَّهِ تَعَالَى He said, a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not been given anything better than having good thoughts of his Lord. Right? And he said, the reason for this is وَذَلِكَ أَنَّ الْخَيْرَ بِيَدِهِ And that is because all, all khair, all good are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want something in your life, whether it be children or wealth or a specific degree or a specific job or something in this life, and you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you put in the work to go and seek it and you have good thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then be idhni lahi ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will either give you what you want or will give you what is khair for you or will replace it for something which is even better for you in the hereafter. Or even may that may be a reason for which sharr and evil and things that may harm you may be protected and stopped from, uh, you may be protected from and stopped from actually reaching you. So always know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept your dua. Allah is fa'alun lima yurid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able, it does whatever he wants. وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ As Allah mentioned in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do anything and everything. So as a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should never ever have uh, bad thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, let's talk about يعني, الخوف. Um, something related to it, which is something known as الْأَمْنُ مِنْ مَكْرِ اللَّهِ Right? الْأَمْنُ مِنْ مَكْرِ اللَّهِ Which is a, a very, very dangerous thing. What is الْأَمْنُ مِنْ مَكْرِ اللَّهِ? الأمن من مكر الله تعالى is when a person feels like they are what safe from the punishment of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. They feel like they are safe from um, them ever falling into a specific situation where they may end up getting punished or falling into a specific sin or anything similar to that. Now, generally, who 
feels like they are safe from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of the time it's a person who is a sinner. Right? A lot of the time sinners when they when they're doing and they're committing sins, they feel like they're safe from the 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 the, the, the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what makes you yani, how, how can you ever feel like you're safe from the one who is what? Fa'alun lima yurid, ala kulli shay'in qadir, the one who's able to do anything and everything. You are never safe from the from the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a, يعني, a, a dangerous mindset to have. Some of the Salaf, rahimahumullah, they would even fear for themselves, right? They would fear for themselves, well, subhanAllah, they would fear for themselves that the ni'am and the, the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon them from knowledge is some is istidra, istidraj. What is istidraj? They would see it to be um, some form of يعني, slow, them slowly being dragged into the punishment of Allah or where it may be used against them. And why do they feel like this? One of the reasons could be is where they feel like they have not um, done shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are not grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, uh, for the blessings that they have being bestowed with. And the reality is, يعني, the, the ulama of the passage is Imam Ahmad rahimahullah. If you look at his life, and the amount of uh, 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 ibadat he would do, the uh, amount of uh, active worship he would do, on top of the fact that he would teach ilm and he would spread ilm and he would seek knowledge. And his whole life somewhat revolved around worship. But yet him and other scholars like him would feel like as if they are in a dangerous situation. يعني, a Muslim should ever, never ever feel like, خلاص, I'm muttaqi, I'm يعني, a pious person. I'm the most pious person. And بإذنillah, يعني, Jannah is, is secured for me. You never know what's going to happen to you. Always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for thabat, for, uh, for you to be um, firm upon the religion. Which is why in every single salah, in every single rak'ah, what do we ask? إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطِ المستقيم. Guide us to the straight path. Now, what does that even mean? Guide us to the straight path if we are Muslims. Guidance is two types. There's hidayatun ila sirat wa hidayatun fi sirat. There's guidance to the straight path and there's guidance to keep you firm while you're on this path up until you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us firm. Now, he carries on to say, so he's described them, he said they are those who have built يعني, their, their, their relationship between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their act of worship between al-raja, the hope, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the mercy of Allah and the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the fear of the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? They are in between. They, they don't push themselves towards one side nor do they push themselves towards too much towards the other, the other side as well. Then he says, وَهُمُ الَّذِينَ مَلَأَ الْإِلَاهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ بِوِدَادِهِ وَمَحَبَّةِ الرَّحْمَانِ He said, and they are those who which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has filled their hearts with mala al ilahu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has filled their hearts, kulubahum, bi widadihi, and with his devotion, wa mahabbati al Rahman, and for the love of al Rahman, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are those who their heart is full of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it shows in their actions. Why? Because as the poet said, law kana hubbuka sadiqan la ata'atahu inna al muhibba, liman yuhibbu mutiru. If your love, لو كان حبك الصادق لا طعته. If your love was real, يعني was real, لا طعته. You would have obeyed him. إن المحبة لمن يحب مطيعه. Verily, the lover obeys the one who he loves. إن المحبة لمن يحب مطيعه. And that's the reality. If you look at your relationship between you and your mother, you and your father. Right, those that you truly love in your life, right? And if they tell you to do something, if they ask you to do something, you do it. And a lot of the time, you do this out of love for them. Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who bestowed upon you the greatest of all blessings, which is what? Al-Islam. Look out in the street now when you go outside and you see people wandering. They don't know what they're doing in this life. Right? Go out 10, 11 o'clock, you see people drunk on the floor. Some people dazed out because of certain drugs they're taking. Some people jumping to their death out of suicide and depression and all of these things. And a lot of the time it comes down to what? They're trying to fill that thing in their heart. They have something in their heart that يعني, they just don't know what will fill it. They may, and you'll see it, people will reach the pinnacle of wealth, right? But yet they still don't feel 
content. Why? Because they don't have the greatest blessing, which is what? Al-Iman and Al-Islam. Allah bi dhikri Allahi tatma'innu al-quloob, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned. Verily do hearts find rest in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the reality. In acts of worship, in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in reciting the Qur'an, there is a type of peace and tranquility and serenity the heart feels that cannot be, يعني, you can't get from anything else. No wealth, no fun, no relationships. Nothing can bring you that type of contentment and peace and serenity other than the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those who have become Muslim will tell you of this. Yani we feel it a lot of the time when we're reciting the Quran and when we go through, when we, especially in the month of Ramadan when our Iman is a lot higher, maybe sometimes when we start yani, trying to practice the Islam a lot more, we feel we, we feel that, 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 that Iman boost. But those of, of our Muslim brothers and sisters who lived the life of disbelief will be able to tell you how they feel as Muslims and how it impacted their life and how it filled that void that they were looking for in يعني, for many, many years, if, uh, 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 يعني, as the case is for, for a lot of them. And that's this, it's the greatest of all blessings. So shouldn't you as a, as a, as a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for this greatest blessing? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he talks about the believers in the Qur'an he says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ He said, there are those who take besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala things that they worship, deities, things that they worship, right? يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ They love them the same way that they should love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the believers what? وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ But those who believe their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even more and is even greater than that. So you as a believer, your highest level of love should be solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he to, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he talked about the, the relationship between halawat al-iman and the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. What does halawat al-iman mean? Halawat al-iman means the sweetness of iman, right? Prophet ﷺ, he said, man kunna fihi wajida halawat al-iman. Three, right? Whoever has these things within them will find the sweetness of iman. Will find the sweetness of iman. And from them he said, an yakuna Allahu wa rasuluhu ahabba ilayhi mimma siwahuma. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is more beloved to you than anything else. Anything else in this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are more, are more beloved to you. When it comes to the, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, يعني, it's a bit of a long topic and we could talk about it. We can talk about the, uh, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a tawab, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a rahim, and يعني, all of these different things that can somewhat relate to it. And generally what we have is how we can attain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how we يعني, how we can get or shall we say strengthen our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right two things that we can kind of talk about now let's talk about the first one and they, they they're very they overlap in terms of the things that you would generally end up doing for you to attain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Number one, you need to be a believer who, first of all, does their obligatory acts of worship. Without doing your obligatory acts of worship, you are already at loss. Yani, you're not even at zero, you're minus. Right? You need to work on your obligatory acts of worship. Salah, number one, the most important of them. And the Prophet ﷺ, look, at the, look, look at the best example, right? Look at the best example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his relationship with Salah and our relationship with Salah. His relationship with Salah was what? Arihna ya Bilal, arihna. He would say, oh Bilal, do the iqamah so that we may relax. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would find peace and tranquility and relaxation in the Salah, which is something we should strive to and do, right? Make sure you're praying your Salawat and your five daily prayers. Make sure you're uh, fasting in the blessed month of Ramadan. These are obligatory acts of worship every believer should do. Make sure you're paying your zakat if you're eligible to pay zakat, right? 
which unfortunately many Muslims, they don't learn about zakah. Many of them are eligible to pay zakah, but they don't learn about it. Which, and, they will be, and they will be eligible to pay it and liable on the day of judgment. You as a believer, zakah is not something you will be excused for. Why? Because it's from the basic things from your religion. It's, it's, it's the most, and it's from the wajibat. You're not excused when it comes to obligatory actions, right? Now that's the difference, right? When, you're, when you commit a sin and you don't know it's a sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not punish you for that. But if you're a believer who grew up in a Muslim family, who knew zakat is wajib, right? But never ended up learning it. And throughout his whole life, yani, was eligible to pay it. You will not be excused on the day of judgment. How can you be excused? You, you neglected your religion in reality. It's that part of it. So how can you be uh, excused in this instance? On top of that, you do your nawafil ibadat. And we're going to get to it, inshallah ta'ala, because after this, the, 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 the poet, he talks, the, the sheikh, rahimullah, he talks about fara'id and nawafil and stuff like that. So, number one, you, you make sure you do your obligatory acts of worship. Number two, you make sure you do your nawafil. I'm going to get to that in a little bit more detail. Number three, and this more relates to both, how you can attain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how you can strengthen that love in, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart which is to recite the Qur'an. And when I say recite the Qur'an, you recite the Qur'an with tadabbur, with trying to understand it and trying to implement the things you learn from it in your life. That's why it's so vital for you to learn the Arabic language. And it's not difficult. Wallahi, wallahi, it's not difficult for you to learn the Arabic language. If you apply yourself for about a year and a half, two years max, you will get to a level where if you hear the Qur'an, you can understand it. Maybe even less if you apply yourself even more. Right, we go through how many years of, edu of of education in school, prim primary school. We start with reception, nursery, primary school, high school, college, uni. Yeah, and all of those years, six, seven, eight hours in the day, we're learning something else. We can't put a, a, an hour a day, four or five hours in the week, just towards learning Arabic, so we can strengthen not our, only our relationship with the Quran, but with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and eventually within. A year and a half, a year, two years, when we hear the Qur'an and we stand in tarawih, we can understand the Qur'an and we can taste the true sweetness of Iman. And it, this is something we should strive to do. ta'ala. So, recitation of the Qur'an. So you recite it, you read it, you ponder over it, you seek guidance through it. Right? You ponder over the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you... Look at the verse and you see the ending of it, right? So we all know when you come across a verse in the Quran, you will come across a lot of the time it will, it will end with "Huwa Sami'u Al Basir, Huwa Al Alim, Huwa Al Hakim Al Khabir, Huwa Al Aziz Al Hakim, Yani Huwa Al Aziz Al Rahim." All of these, yani these characteristics and names of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So you ponder over these names and you see how does that relate to to the verse and the things that are being talked about in the verses and the things that are being talked about in this chapter. And that was not only Strengthen your relationship in the Quran and increase your iman, but it will allow you to get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot better. Why? Because the best way to know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to know about Allah through his names and attributes, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described himself. Okay. So he says, uh, the, the poet Rahimullah he said, they are the, the ones who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has filled their hearts with love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he carries on to say, وَهُمُ الَّذِينَ أَكْثَرُ مِن ذِكْرِهِ فِي السِّرِّ وَالْإِعْلَانِ وَالْأَحْيَانِ And they are those who أَكْثَرُ they, they increase a lot مِن ذِكْرِهِ يعني In terms of his remembrance, subhanahu wa ta'ala. فِي السِّرِّ يعني When it comes to be uh, uh, quiet or being alone, right? When no one can see them. والإعلان, where everyone may be able to see them. والأحيان, in all, all times. They're always doing the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the beautiful thing about the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that it's something so easy to do, but has such a great reward. Has such a great reward. Kalimatani, khafifatani ala lisan, thaqilatani fil mizan, habibatani ila rahman, subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanallah al azim. Right? Two words, light upon the scale. A light upon the tongue, heavy upon the scale. 
beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanallah al-azim. Right? After every salah, what do we have? After every salah, we have subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, 33 times each. What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa say? Whoever does this after every salah, غفر له خطاياه وإن كان مثل زبد البحر. His sins, يعني his, ma- his minor sins will be forgiven even if it's like, you know, the scum and the foam on the sea. Even if it's that much. These small things, your morning adhkar, your evening adhkar, your istighfar, right? Istighfar has such such a great reward. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he talks about it in the Quran, right? إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا These are from the, the فوائد of istighfar, right? يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا He will allow the heavens to rain down upon you. وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ And he will increase, increase you in amwal and he will increase you in children, right? وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا And he will create for you heavens and he will, uh, I mean, he will create for you gardens and he will create for you rivers, right? I'll give you, an, uh, I'll tell you a story about al-istighfar. I remember, um, and this was the earlier years when I went to study abroad. I think this is maybe the first year or something like that. Now, I remember I came across the, this fa'idah of uh, that istighfar is a way for you to increase your يعني, rizq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's one of the means. Allah mentions it in this verse in Surah Nur, right? So I needed a semester was about to start. I came back to Saudi a little bit early. I needed a little bit extra money, right? So I would start to do istighfar a lot. Um, so one day I got a call, got a phone call from one of the brothers, English teachers, in, in who teaches English in the Jamia. And um, he said to me, Akhi, do you want work? Right? I said to him, yeah. He said, but it's only for a week. I said, I'm happy with that. Right? Um, he said, it's like two hours a day. I said, happy days. I don't mind. You know? Um, so I worked and it was one week. It's ajib how it worked out to be. One week where they didn't, they needed a teacher for that specific week. Um, and... I didn't have anything to teach. I was just making up conversations for the students to kind of learn and practice and stuff like that. And for those two weeks, for those two hours I was doing, I worked 10 hours a week and I think I made like a thousand real for that um, for that one week worth of, of, of work. And a thousand real is some decent money. You, you get 840 real for the whole month as a student, right? So a thousand is even more than that. And I, I put that back to, uh, I put that down to, to being istighfar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani istighfar is a means for not only for your sins to be forgiven, but it's a means, wallahi, it's a means for you to increase in rizq and increase in wealth and yani for the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come down upon you. And this is even mentioned in the Quran. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this in Surah Nur. Right? يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا وَيُمْدِدْكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا Ibn Qayyim rahimullah, he, he talks about the reasons for risk to, uh, to increase in risk and he mentions from them is a taqwa from them is um, being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَلَئِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions and from them is is al-istighfar from them is al-istighfar now another thing Ibn Qayyim rahimullah, he mentions about the, the, the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is it's very important he said that sada al-qalb is bi amrain. He said that the hardening or the um, somewhat of a wrapping around your heart, shall we say, uh, is by two things, right? And we know the harder a heart becomes, the more um, desensitized it comes towards sins. And يعني, ibadat become difficult upon that person. We want to be a person who has a qalbun salim, who has a soft heart. He says, a hard heart can come come through two things. Number one is through a dhunub, through doing sins. And number two is al-ghafla. Al-ghafla. What's, what is ghafla? And ghafla, unfortunately, many of us are affected by this. Ghafla is heedlessness, right? Where you're heedless. It's like, and it's more of a mental, it's more not something you may physically do. It has يعني, effects on what you physically do, but it's more of a mental state. Where you're heedless of sins and disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and falling into things that will lead you towards doing sins, right? It's as if you've become distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and sins are not as um, they don't have such an effect on your heart as they as they used to, right? And we all we can all testify to this. When our iman is high and we commit a sin, we physically feel it in our heart. We physically feel like something is wrong. Like we've يعني, something in our in our heart, we feel like something. We feel something physically. But once you're a person who commits sins and becomes heedless, it's as if you don't feel that same regret when you commit a sin. You don't feel that same down feeling that you would once you commit a sin. And this is this is this is the most dangerous thing about it because it it's somewhat of a train that kind of takes you towards shaitan, right? To where you end up doing so many sins because you're so desensitized, you will do all of these crazy sins that you would never do before, right? And only through the, the mercy and the father of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will you be removed from this heedlessness. And you will think, Hani, what happened to me? I would never do any of these things. So if you as a believer feel like you're somewhat falling down that path, the cure to that is Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he said, He jala'uhu bil istighfari wa dhikr. He said, And the way for you to kind of purify and clean your heart is by number one, al istighfar. And, and number two, the dhikr, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it could be subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha in Allah, Allahu Akbar. Right? And dhikr has many, many benefits. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu dhkurullah dhikran kathira wa sabi'uhu bukratan wa asila. O you who believe, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most people should be happy that they don't have to say it's not God. They face You can have it for both. You can have it for both. You can have the intention when you're saying al-istighfar because يعني, you're doing it, number one, you know it's going to increase you, you in risk. Number two, you know it's going to be a means through which your sins will be forgiven. Okay? Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, O oh, you who believe, increase, uh, O oh, you who believe, udhkurullah dhikran kathira. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot, a great remembering. يعني, increase in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the sahaba radiallahu anhum, came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said that the, the, the affairs of Islam, all of these acts of worship, they're, they're a little bit too much for me to do. What, what do you advise me with? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the best person to come to when it came to advice, right? Us, when we want advice in a specific affair, we go to the best person, the person that we trust, the person that we know will give us the best advice. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the best person to come to and he would give the best of advice. He said, لا يزال لسانك. He said, لا يزال لسانك رطبا من ذكر الله تعالى. He said, make sure that your tongue is always wet with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa taala. If you find it difficult to fast many days in the week, to pray for many hours at night, to to give a lot of money out in charity, do this thing, right? Make sure that you're always trying your best to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're walking somewhere, when you're walking back from somewhere, when you're driving somewhere, when you're on the bus, all of when you're waiting for something, the dhikr of Allah, very, very simple. Not only does it have a positive effect on your heart, positive effect on your daily life, but it will be a means through which your sins will be forgiven. It's very simple, istighfar. Yani you can do astaghfirullah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah. And wallahi, I, wallahi, this is not even a promise from me. I promise you, that your life will change. If you're a person who is a person who always does the, the, the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will have effect on, an effect on your salah. When you come to pray your salah, you'll feel like you have more khushur, right? When you make dua, you will feel like you're closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of when you're making dua. Why? Because sometimes even when we make dua, sometimes we do feel a little bit, our heart feels a bit distant, distant, right? But when you're a person who has the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll feel not only does it have a positive effect on how you feel as a person, how calm and يعني, tranquil you feel, but it will have effect on your ibadat. It will have an effect uh, such as salah. It will have an effect when you're making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi, your life will change. If you're a person who, not, who does their morning adhkar, their evening, uh, uh, the evening adhkar, who does the adhkar after the prayers, right? Who does the, who does the general dhikr, whether it's, Astaghfirullah, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. When you're waiting, walking somewhere, and then it somewhat become natural to where you don't even have to think, where you'll just be waiting and you'll just be doing it. 
which is one of the benefits of doing something consistently. Now, Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he has a book known as Al-Wabil Al-Sayyib. Al-Wabil Al-Sayyib. And it talks about this topic, this topic of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he mentions so, he's got like a chapter where he talks about like a somewhat of an introduction. Then he talks about the benefits of dhikr, the benefits of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and then he talks, then he, I think towards the last section, it's more of just adhkar, right? So I, I'll mention a few benefits um, from this specific book. So the first one that Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he mentions, he says that it's, it's qut it's the fuel and like it's like food for the heart and the soul right and he mentions he talks about a story of his sheikh sheikh al-islam ibn taymiyyah and he said i would find my sheikh he would sit from after fajr up until midday right and i would ask him why you would do this and he would say right right he said this is my Food, this is my fuel. If I don't do this and if I don't take my fuel, I won't have any strength. I won't have any power in, throughout the day. Right? This would physically this would help him. Yani ibn Taymiyyah, this would help him physically, he would feel like. And this is from the benefits of dhikr. It's, it's like the fuel for the heart and the soul. Ibn Qayyim, he also mentions that الخطايا, it's a means through which sins are forgiven. And we know as Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna al-hasanat yudhibna sayyat. Verily, good deeds, what do they do? They wipe out sins. And from the good deeds are what? The dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another one he mentions is that it's jannah. It's seeds, or shall we say, it will allow you to um, plant things in jannah for you. Right? Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that jannah is what? It's turba, it's 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 dirt and it's, it's mud and it's sand, shall we say, is tayyiba, it's good, it's pure, right? Uh it's water is pure, يعني, sweet, maybe you might even be able to describe it as. Um right? it's it, it's it fields are somewhat of a place where it gathers water to which it will allow it to grow crops. And the, the things that will, uh, the seeds, shall we say, for it are subhanallah, uh, subhanallah alhamdulillah, wa, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. And the seeds and the things that you will able to, that I will allow for these plants to grow are what? Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Right? These are things that will allow you to grow thing, grow these trees and things in Jannah for you. And this is your own Jannah, you know, the, the one that's specific to you. Now, um, yani that's more, we'll kind of leave it at that for the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can go on for, for, for a very, uh, very long time. طيب. Now, the next one he says, يَتَقَرَّبُونَ إِلَى الْمَلِيكِ بِفِعْلِهِمْ طَاعَاتِهِ وَالتَّرْكِ لِلْعِصِيَانِ And they are those who they seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to their king, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala بِفِعْلِهِمْ with their actions. Ta'atihi through the obedience isyani and through leaving of sins. So not only do they seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through their good deeds, but they seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through leaving of sins. Prophet he mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said, abdi That a servant of mine, he he doesn't get closer to me through anything better than or more beloved to me than the things that I have made obligatory upon him. Fasting the month of Ramadan, paying your zakah, praying your five daily prayers. And my servant, he does not carry on coming closer to me and يعني, seeking nearness to me through nawafil until I love that person. Right? And what's, what's, the, what's the fruit of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the end, If this my slave asks me for something, I will give it to him. Or I will give it to her. And if he seeks refuge in me, يعني if he's in a difficult situation and he needs to be saved, I will save him, I will give him aid, and I will give him refuge. And this is from the, the fruits of Doing not only the uh, obligatory acts of worship, but also doing the voluntary acts of worship. Right? You as a Muslim should not only concentrate on obligatory acts of worship. 
Try your best to do your voluntary acts of worship. The first one you can start with is what? That which relates to your five daily prayers. Which is what? Your nawafil prayer. Your sunnah prayers, shall we say. The two before Fajr. Prophet ﷺ, what did he describe it as? خَيْرٌ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا فِيهَا It's better than the dunya and everything within it. The two sunnah before Fajr. Before Dhuhr, there's two ways you can pray. You can either pray two before Dhuhr, two after Dhuhr, or you can pray four before Dhuhr and two after Dhuhr. Right? After Maghrib, you have two. After Ish, you have two. Right? These are like the ten or the twelve that have been narrated that the Prophet ﷺ would constantly do. He would constantly do these. To the extent when he was traveling, the only thing he would not leave off was the two before Fajr. Yani, that's, how, that's how rewarding the two before Fajr are. And the thing is, make sure... At yani, the beginning, it might be a little bit difficult. But you have to build a habit. When you build a habit of doing it, it becomes easy. When you build a habit of doing it, you feel bad when you don't do it. right? And they say it takes around 28 days to... Um, to somewhat build uh, to build a habit, right? If you do something consistently for twenty eight days, you somewhat at the end of that twenty those twenty eight days, you've built that habit to where it becomes natural to you. So, from today, if you're a person that that doesn't pray their sunnah prayers, pray your sunnah prayers, right? If you can't and you're rushing, make up for it towards the end of the day, right? On top of that, we have what we have the witted prayer, the witted prayer, Prophet ﷺ, he gave Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu three advices, right? From them was what? That you pray witr before you go to sleep. If you're so tired to where you can't pray witr, or if you're so lazy, right, shall we say, to where you, you're too lazy to pray witr, the minimum for witr is what? Is one raka'ah. Come on, you can't be that lazy. You know, it's one raka'ah. That's the minimum. If you feel tired and you, 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 and you can't, be bothered, shall we say, to pray three, which is, يعني, it's not a, a right way of thinking. But unfortunately, it's a way many people think. Pray one rak'ah. And you get the the, the, the virtue of praying witr. Um, now, we said they get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through doing good deeds, and they also get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through leaving off sins. Now, sins has many, many evil effects. Not only the fact that it's. Um, Makes you يعني, You might be from those that may be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala It has other effects on other aspects of your life Right? Sins, what does it do to your heart? It hardens your heart It blackens your heart As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa That you'll get نُقْطَةٌ سَوْدَاء Right? So as if a, block, a, a black dot will be placed on your heart so If you carry on doing these sins And you don't do istighfar And you don't do tawbah to purify your heart It may end up Covering your whole heart to where you become like what? You become a person. You do not know khair. It has no effect on you. You hear the Quran, it has no effect on you. You hear the kala, the speech of the Prophet, it has no effect on you. Right? Your fellow brother or fellow sister tries to advise you, give you a reminder, it has no effect on you. Right? And you do not do inkar of munkar. Right, the beginning you would feel if you see something haram, يعني, you wouldn't, may not necessarily sometimes say something, but in your heart you would feel like, oh, subhanAllah, this is not good. But the more sins you do, what does it do? It removes that feeling in your heart. It removes that feeling in your heart where you hate sins and you dislike them and you feel like they are something bad to where it becomes normal. It has no effect. يعني, you see someone doing something haram in the middle of the street, you don't even bat an eyelid, you don't blink. Right? It doesn't make you think about the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how this is haram. It doesn't even make you think about the ni'am of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon you al-Islam. Right? Which is something we should think about. When we see some of these drug addicts or drunks in the middle of the streets or people just wandering, not knowing what to do in life, we should remember the greatest blessing, which is the ni'mah of al-Islam. Another uh, evil effect, another evil effect, and I'll, يعني, I'll mention just this one, because there's many that we can talk about. Ibn Qaymi has a kitab known as Adda'u 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 I think it's been translated into English. Um, the cure and the disease. Right, the cure and the disease. In there, he's got a section where he talks about the evil effects of sins. 
Right, so have a look, read into it. From the evil effects of sins is that it removes the ni'am, the, the uh, blessings in your life. Allah mentions in the Quran, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا قَرْيَةً كَانَتْ آمِنَةً مُطْمَئِنَّةً يَأْتِيهَا رِزْقُهَا رَغَدًا مِنْ كُلِّ مَكَانٍ فَكَفَرَتْ بِأَنْعُمِ اللَّهِ فَأَذَاقَهَا اللَّهُ لِبَاسِ الْجُوعِ وَالْخَوْفِ بِمَا كَانُوا يَسْرَعُونَ Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا قَرْيَةً كَانَتْ آمِنَةً مُطْمَئِنَّةً There was a, a, a qarya, a village. كانت آمنة مطمئنة. There was, يعني, there, was, there, was, there was peace and tranquility in this qarya. And the risk for the people within this qarya would come to them يعني, in um, uh, vast amounts, shall we say. من كل مكان, from all aspects. فكفرت بأنعم الله. But they what? They were not grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of these blessings. So what did Allah do? Allah, he removed these blessings. And he gave them what? Al-ju' wal khawf. He gave them hunger and fear, which is one of the worst types of punishment. Not only does it affect you physically, but it affects you mentally. When you're in a state, when you don't even feel safe, you can't sleep, you can't eat. When you can't eat, when you don't have food to eat, right? When you don't have food to eat, let's, shall we say, you, you feel weak and fragile and fray and you can't even do anything. You don't want to do anything. So this type of punishment, not only did it affect it, was it a punishment physically, but it was a mental type of punishment as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from that. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who are grateful for all of the blessings in this life. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين بينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين إن شاء الله تعالى we're going to be carrying on so we're on number seven so line number seven so the Sheikh رحمه الله he said وفعل الفرائض والنوافل دأبهم مع رؤية التقصير والنقصان so he said that what they busy themselves with is فعل الفرائض doing Obligatory acts of worship One nawafil And voluntary acts of worship Da'buhum يعني this is basically what they do it's, it's the thing that keeps them busy مَعَ رُؤْيَةِ التَّقْصِيرِ وَالنُقْصَانِ And at the same time when they're doing these obligatory acts of worship And these voluntary acts of worship They see themselves to still be deficient And they still feel like they are uh, Not the best Yani it's a probably easy way to translate it. Meaning, they don't feel like they have reached the pinnacle of, of piety. They still feel like there's a way for them to go. Yani there's still a lot of room for improvement when it comes to their acts of worship. And this is how a believer should be, right? Never feel like um, you have reached the top of everything. You have reached the top of Iman. Yani that's it. The Salaf rahimahumullah, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they would never feel like that. And you need to feel like you are always in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we are in need of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Antum al fuqara'u in Allah, Wallahu al ghani al hamid. That you are poor, you are needy of Allah. You are needy, you are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one that is all rich. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is all rich. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would say, in a dua, Allahumma, Allahumma rahmataka arju. Wala takilni ila nafsi tarfa ta'in. Wala takilni ila nafsi tarfa ta'in. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rahmataka arju. Your mercy is what I hope for. And do not leave me to myself, even if it's for this, يعني, as small as, a, as, a, as a, the time that it takes to blink. Right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did not want to be left to himself. Why? Because without the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without the aid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without the blessings and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, none of us will be able to ever succeed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in an authentic hadith, he said, لَن يُدْخِلَ أَحَدًا الْجَنَّةَ بِعَمَلِهِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never enter anyone into Jannah specifically just because of their good deeds. So they said, not even you, Ya Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, not even me. إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَغَمَّدَنِيَ اللَّهُ بِرَحْمَتِهِ 
unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showers and bestows his mercy upon me. Now what does this mean? Does this, does this mean that we don't do righteous deeds? Right? No, this means we do righteous deeds and we try our, our, our best. But this hadith is trying to explain to us that our deeds are not worthy enough for us to be put it on the table and pl place it as a trade and trade that in for Jannah. Yeah, that's the reality. We will never be able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way he deserves to be worshipped in truth. We can just try our best and we will always be deficient in many aspects. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only the one who is pure, who is, uh, who is I mean, um, perfect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who is perfect in all aspects. Al kamalu lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the only one who's perfect. So we should always be ones who try our best, hope for the, the mercy and for the forgiveness and for the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but at the same time always feel like there's always room for improvement why because when you feel like there's always room for improvement you will keep on pushing yourself right you will keep on pushing yourself if you stop pushing yourself and you stop striving that will open a door for shaitan to come in and to do a swast to where he will make you think that you have reached the top now you can do all of these other things that will Maybe يعني, allow you to fall into haram Because that's the reality Shaitan he doesn't come to you And tell you to fall into haram straight away No he does it step by step Especially if he knows that you're a person Who tries their best I need to pray their salahs And tries their best to do nawafil And, write, and um, voluntary acts of worship He will come with things that will maybe Busy you from the things that you would generally do Right and then it will lead you to the things that are considered to be disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then that will open the door to lead you to doing things to doing uh, that, that are considered to be haram. So see, he leads you step by step. Maybe some of those old friends might come back into your life. Those ones that, the ones that had a negative influence on you, right? Out of nowhere, they give you a call, tell you to come out, يعني, or we're having a get together. Do you want to come? First time, no. Second time, no. Third time, fourth time, maybe the fifth time you'll say yes. You'll go with them one time, right? When you say, oh, I'm never going back there again. But then you will maybe think about it and think about how you enjoyed yourself a little bit. And, you know, you enjoy doing some of those things and you enjoyed that company. Maybe not necessarily doing those haram things, but you enjoyed the company. You enjoyed those friends, right? Then that will open that door towards you. يعني, allowing you to fall back into that lifestyle again So try your best to cut off those things That will lead you to doing haram Not just stopping yourself from doing haram things But cutting off the things that will lead you towards doing the haram Right? What does, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about zina? He says لا تقربوا الزنا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say لا تزنو Right? Do not commit zina He says do not come near it Meaning anything that will lead to it, cut it off. Why? Because by the time you've committed it, you would have committed many other things that will have considered to be haram. And the reality is, those things are more of a driving force than you actually pushing yourself to doing the sin in the first place. Right? And that's how shaitan will drag you. He will and he'll bring you close, he'll pull out some bait. Right? And you will think there's nothing wrong with it. And then he'll drag you into... Into haram. Now, um, let's carry on. So he says, "Sabar al-nufusa ala al-makarih kulliha shawqan ila ma fihi min ihsani." Sabar al-nufus. They are their their souls and their their bodies are patient upon the makarih, upon the the difficulties. All of them, kulliha shawqan, out yearning ila ma fihi min ihsani, yearning for that which is which is, uh, يعني إحسان, which is good from all of these things. Meaning, when it comes to the difficulties that are somewhat related to acts of worship, because when it comes to difficulties and acts of worship, there's two types. There's a difficulty that can't be removed from that act of worship, right? Such as Hajj. Hajj, there's difficulty. You can't, and you can't remove the difficulty of doing tawaf and safa and marwa and going to the jamarat and going from to Arafah and from Arafah to Muzdalifa and staying the night in Muzdalifa. All of these difficult things, they're part and parcel of the act of worship. Fasting is difficult. It's difficult upon the body, right? Then there's added difficulty that 
can somewhat be removed from the picture. Yeah, I'll give you an example. A person goes to a person goes to the haram, right? And they have the choice of either praying in the heat, in the sun, duhr time, or praying in the AC where you're still inside the haram and you'll get the same reward. But a person will pray in the heat on purpose. Why? Because they feel like they think they're going to get more reward because, because they're going through difficulty. No. And that's not how Islam works. Islam is a religion of ease. The difficulty that's attached to the act of worship that can't be removed, you'll be rewarded for that. Any type of extra difficulty you add upon yourself that's not related to the act of worship is not considered to be reward. It's not, it's not something you'll be rewarded for. It's not a uh, a thing that's mahmud. It's not a thing that's praised, right? So that's the difference. Don't put yourself in difficult situations where you don't have to, and then they don't have an any type of relation to the act of worship. I'll give you another example. People, if you need to pray salah and you don't have anywhere to pray and there's no place to go, don't pray in the middle of the street. Go find a place where it's quiet to pray, right? Maybe a back street, maybe a, a place in, uh, let's say if you're out in the in town or something like that, maybe the changing room, maybe somewhere that's quiet where you know um, there's there won't be a possibility of where something might happen, right? Because when you're praying, you're focused on salah, you don't know what anyone can do to you. Right. But if you think that you're going to be more rewarded by praying in the middle of the street, uh, like, like right in the middle of the road where people are walking and stuff like that, I mean, there's, there's no extra virtue that's attached to that. Okay, So as a Muslim, don't add extra difficulty to your life that has no relation to the act of worship, thinking that you're going to be rewarded for it. All right, That's not always the case, unless it's specifically added to the act of worship where it can't be removed from it. Now, so... So the Shaykh Rahimullah is saying they are believers who they are patient upon the difficulties that come at them in life. And, diff- and patience is of three types. You have a sabru ala ta'atillah, wa sabru an ma'asiyatillah, wa sabru ala aqdari, aqdari Allah. Number one is the patience upon the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because it requires patience for you to be a person who is firm upon the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from your youth up until your old age, up until the day you die. You need number one, the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the aid of Allah. And you need to be patient. You need to be patient. Why? Waking up for fajr in the morning when it's cold and making wudu when it's cold. For you to go to the masjid and it's cold in the morning. It requires patience. For you to make sure you pray your five daily t- prayers on time, properly, with khushur, Pray your sunnah requires patience. For you to sit, come to the masjid, learn about your religion, read the Quran, learn about that which will help you get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It requires patience. For you to teach your children, teach your wife, teach your family, right? The religion. Give them tarbiyah. It requires patience. And this is patience that you will, this is a, 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 a thing that you will all be rewarded for. All of these things that we're doing, bi ta'ala, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the highest reward. And look, the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is from the mercy of Allah. When you commit a sin, how many sins get written down? Only one sin. But when you commit a good deed, the minimum you will get is, is 10. Up until a multiplication, multiplied to, to a amount only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And this is from this is from the uh the fadl and the, the virtue and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the second type of patience is patience from sins. Right? You see something that honey it is it's somewhat attractive to you and it's pu- pulling you in, but yet you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your patience upon staying away from that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for that. Right? To the extent where the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Man hamma bi wa lam ya'malha, that whoever intends to do an evil sin but then remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he stays away from that sin and stops himself, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? Does Allah write down a sin for that person? No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes down a reward for that person. SubhanAllah. Allah will reward you. For if you're about to commit a sin and you remember your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and you stop because you remembered your Lord, Allah will reward you for that. So for you to be patient upon staying away from sins. The third type of patience is for you to be patient upon the, tra- the, 
things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed, right? And I'll tell you, look, this is the best thing you can do when something happens in life. When something happens in life, and a lot of the time when it's something that we don't like, right? The first thing that should come to your mind is Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved me from something even worse. Right? Alhamdulillah, maybe there was no khair in this for me. Right? Alhamdulillah, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has something else in store for me that will be even better than this in the future. Not only will that help the situation that you're in, but it will strengthen your tawakkul, your dependence upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? It will it will better your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So always remember that. You got into a car crash. Alhamdulillah, maybe Allah was saving me from something, right? Alhamdulillah, it's not as bad as it looks. Alhamdulillah, maybe this is a way through which my sins can be purified. I can be purified, my sins can be removed, removed from me. Alhamdulillah, maybe Allah was saving me from something even worse happening. Right? So always say Alhamdulillah in every situation that you're in. So th those are the three types of um, of patience, shall we say. Then he says, Rahim, uh, Rahimahullah, نَزَلُوا بِمَنْزِلَةِ الرِّضَى فَهُمْ بِهَا قَدْ أَصْبَحُوا فِي جَنَّةٍ وَآمَانِ Subhanallah. He says, and they brought themselves down to a, a, a level to which they are pleased. So then they have become or they have entered into a jannah and they have an and and peace. And that's the reality. The Salaf Rahimahumullah they would say that a rida billahi is Jannah dunya is Jannah to dunya wa mustarahu al abidin. It's the Jannah of the believers, right? And it's the place where the believers relax. Or some it's a situation where the believers will be able to relax within. Why? Because when something happens to you in life. And let's say it's something bad, right? You missed your flight, you missed your train, um, you lost out on something, maybe you got scammed, maybe someone stole your car, maybe something happened. Once you could, there's a level where you're patient upon it, right? Where you don't act irrationally and you start doing haram things and you start cursing. You don't do that. As a Muslim, there should be at least that level where you don't act like that. But then there's a level even higher than it, which is known as al-rida. We need to be pleased with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you're pleased because you know that the, the creator of creation, the most perfect in all aspects, the most wise and the most knowledgeable, the all-hearing and the all-seeing, has willed for this to happen. And this only happened in accordance to the perfect wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I am pleased with which with that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed for me. How happy would you be? And how not even happy, shall we say, but how content would your heart be? Alhamdulillah. Inshallah khair. You know? Inshallah, something good is going to happen. Something better. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maybe saved me from something. And I am happy with this. I'm pleased with it. I'm not even just patient, I'm actually pleased with it. Which is, in reality, it's a station and it's a level that is quite difficult to reach. The first feeling we get when something bad happens is like, oh my days, yani subhanallah, what's happening? Right? Until and, and then we somewhat go back to our senses and say, okay, inshallah khair. But then what about those who when that happens, say alhamdulillah. And they're pleased with the, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I And mean, these are the types of slaves Who will get the, the higher higher levels in Jannah And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala To bless us with that And If you look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And the advice he gave to Ibn Abbas He gave Ibn Abbas golden advice And he said Know that ma asabaka lam yakun li yukhti'aka Wa ma akhta'aka lam yakun li yusiba Know that whatever has come to you and has afflicted you was always going to happen to you. And that which hasn't afflicted you, that which you missed out on, was never ever going to come your way. Right? Once you have that, Prophet is saying to Ibn Abbas, instill this within you. Once you have that in your heart and you know that, you will be always at peace. Why? Because whatever's going to happen to me will happen. 
Inshallah, it's khair. And I hope for the khair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever I'm going to miss out on and whatever will not happen to me, inshallah, will not, hap- will not happen to me. And I hope that is also khair and I hope for the khair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How at peace would you be? How calm would you be? How tranquil would you be in your daily activities, in the things that you do in life, right? One of the things that, we, shall we say, um, ruins our day is not the thing that actually happens, right? It's not the actual thing that we say ruins it. It's our reaction to it. It's our reaction to it. Why? Because the way we react has a negative effect on the rest of our day. But let's say first thing you woke up in the morning, something bad happened, and you had this positive reaction, shall we say. Then can you say my day is ruined? No, you say alhamdulillah, inshallah khair. I hope for more, I hope for good uh, yani from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will be bestowed upon me later on in, in this day, in the week, sometime to come. Bi'idhnillah ta'ala. You know? Um, and I'll give you an example. I remember when I applied to the jamiat, right? And uh, it's, it's, it's somewhat of an example of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you sometimes what is khair for you, so be pleased with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed for you. So I applied to the jamiat, I applied to Medina, and I applied to Qasim. Now, when I applied to Medina, I was hoping for, Medina was the one that I wanted to get into. I only applied for Qasim because I found out about it and I found out Ibn Uthameen was there and his students are there at the moment and that was where he was teaching and stuff like that. So I thought I have the papers, I'll just apply. So I got into Qasim and I didn't get into Medina and there was from our city that I think there was five people that got, no, four or five people got accepted into Medina and I got accepted into Qasim, Right? Now, when I got into Qasim, alhamdulillah, I was happy. Why? Because I got into, in, I got there before the other brothers got accepted, before the acceptance list came out. But when I got there, I would say to myself, well, I'd love to be in Medina. But I only realized as the years went by, um, the blessing of where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put me and how it was actually better for me to be where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put me. And that I should have been pleased with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for me at the beginning. Now I only realized as years went by, right? So always know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you, you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants khair for you, Allah will always give you that which is good for you. It may not necessarily be what you want, but it will be what is what is good for you, what is khair for you in this life and in the hereafter. So always remember that the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the advice of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Anna ma asabaka lam yakun li uqtiak, wa ma akhtaak lam yakun li yusibak." That which has come to you was always going to come to you; it was never going to miss you, and that which you missed out on was never ever going to come your way. Right? You missed out on that job. Inshallah, khair. You get another one. It was never. Go- it was never for you anyway. Right? It was never for you. So don't be upset about it. So the Sheikh rahimullah he says. شكر شكر الذي أولى الخلائق فضله بالقلب والأقوال والأركان. They are those who are grateful to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the one who gave His creation all of these be- all of these bounties and these blessings, and they are grateful to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala by what? بالقلب والأقوال والأركان. With their hearts, right, and with their statements and with their actions. So they are inwardly they are grateful to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. They throw, they, they, they show their gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through statements. So, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and as for the blessings of your Lord, then talk about it, right? So they talk about the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they allow that not only to be a reminder for them, for them to be even more grateful, but for others also to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wal arkani. And they show it through their physical actions as well. It allows them and it pushes them to do more acts of worship Or maybe to even do better in the acts of worship that they are doing So if they pray their salah, they try their best to pray it even better Maybe they might have some issues when it comes to khushur They try their best to pray with khushur Maybe they have, they have, yani they have that fine and they don't pray their nawafil prayer 
they show it through doing praying their sunnah prayers or they may show it by fasting a few days in the week or a few days in the month or by giving out charity yani every month or every day or certain days in the week right where they where they want to show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by giving out in charity or they um set up not necessarily charity organizations but charity projects shall we say right and this is from one of the best ways why because look you as a muslim you need to think about your hereafter in this yani unfortunately all we think about most of the time is this dunya I need a house, I need a car, I need start, I need business, I need, I need to get married, I need children. Once you get the children, I need a house, I need a car. Once you get the house and the car, you have it starting to have two, three, four kids. Or I need a job and I need another income stream just to kind of support it. Maybe another two, three, help me get a little bit more time, more money, right? And then you forget about the hereafter. Then you start thinking, okay, I need to invest for my retirement But what about investing for your hereafter What about investing for your hereafter In terms of seeking knowledge and spreading knowledge Right This Sheikh Rahimahullah Who died He died and Look at this He died Rahimahullah He never visited the west He never visited the west And when he would teach He would benefit his community But he had a few core students those few core students went on to benefit, let's say, the whole world in reality. Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah, he was an ummah. Ibn Uthaymin was one of his students, rahimahullah. Shah Abdul Rahman said, Sa'di, one of his students was Ibn Uthaymin. In reality, he was an ummah. And you would see that. When you go to Unayza, you would see the effect that Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin had on the people, right? Whenever I, the, my teachers in the jami'ah, all of them, they would say, Sheikh uh, Sheikh Muhammad. They, would, they, they wouldn't call him Ibn Uthaymin, they would call Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, Sheikh Muhammad, why his name is Muhammad Ibn Uthaymin. Um, not only did he have a positive effect inside the Mamla in Saudi, he had a positive effect on the, the, the Muslim world and the Western world as well. If you look at the 90s and um, the, the the tapes and the books that were transla translated, a lot of the time you find the fatawa of Ibn Uthaymin, you'd find um, the aqidah books of Ibn Uthaymin, sometimes you might find some of the English, uh, the, the, the fiqh books of Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah. Right? So Shadran Nasir Sa'di who died um, before Ibn, uh, who died before Ibn Uthaymin died, he's in his grave now. Everything that he taught Ibn Uthaymin that Ibn Uthaymin spread to others, he's being rewarded for that. And everything those people learned and spread it to others, he's also getting rewarded for that. So for example, Shah Ibn Uthaymin, uh, Shah Adran Nasir Sa'di taught Ibn Uthaymin. Ibn Uthaymin taught my teachers. Now I'm Teaching you And you will spread it to others And all of that Shaykh uh, Abdul Rahman Nasir In his grave He will be rewarded for it From the things that We learn and we apply and look, look, look at how great of an investment It is for you to Seek beneficial knowledge And for you to spread it Another thing that you can uh, Do to invest in your hereafter Is building masajid Building madaris for tahfidh al-Quran Memorizing the Quran Building wells يعني, All of these things that will Benefit Muslims and benefit people for, for many many years Maybe even centuries after You have gone right, And you're, you're dead, you're in your grave But you'll still reap that reward From those, يعني, those actions that you did Those things that you invested in So As he said uh, The Shaykh Rahimullah They show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Through their heart Through their uh, statements And through their through their actions and Then he said Sahibu at-tawak Sahibu at-tawakkala Fi jami'i umurihim Ma'abad li jahdin Fi ridha rahmani That they In all of their affairs What do they do? They have tawakkal upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And not only do they have reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala But they put in the work To please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's the reality of tawakkul. Tawakkul is what? Tawakkul is sidq al-i'timadi ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi jalbi naf'in aw daf'i dharrin ma'a fi'l al-asbab. It's complete and truthful dependence upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Where you depend upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring about some type of benefit or khair in your life. Or you are seeking the aid of Allah to uh, be some type of protection or to remove some type of harm from your life. 
and you go about and you do the things that will bring these things about right you don't just sit back at home and say I'm, i have to walk upon allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that allah will provide for me no you go out there you look for a job you ask your friends you do you get you make a cv you put the you send it out you put in applications and then you 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 also have that tawakkul that truthful dependence upon allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that allah will provide for you that's the reality of it right and if we look at the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and tawakkul, I'll mention one instant, instance, right, in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that showed the complete and the high level of tawakkul the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had. When the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was making hijrah to Medina, he left Mecca and he was making his way to Medina with Abu Bakr radhiyallahu an. What did the disbelievers of Quraysh do? They sent out horsemen, right? To go after the Prophet ﷺ and to kill him. So the Prophet ﷺ, we all know he hid in the cave, right? And the cave was not a cave where you can see the entrance from it while you're standing up. It was a cave that was somewhat beneath the ground, to where if you look down, you could see the hole, right? So what happened was they, the disbelievers of Quraysh, were around the cave, and the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr radiAllahu anhu. Was in, were in the cave So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu He said if only they were to look at their feet They would see us But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He responded, to, the, responded to, the, uh, to Abu Bakr Ma baluka ya Abu Bakr Right What do you think about Abu Bakr Bithnaini Allahu thalithuhuma What do you think about What do you think about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu About two people When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their third and the Prophet ﷺ, he had no doubt that Allah was going to help him and aid him and save him. In the Quran, what does it say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions. إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا Right? When they were in the cave, when he said to his companion, when the Prophet ﷺ said to his companion, who was who? Abu Bakr. لَا تَحْزَنْ Do not be sad. إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us. And that was the reality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was with them and aided them and helped them. And made the disbelievers of Quraysh oblivious to that which they were looking for, even though it was right in front of them. And then Allah allowed them to, to get into al Medina. Now, the Shaykh rahimullah, he carries on to say, عَبَدُ الْإِلَاهَ عَلَىٰ اعْتِقَادِ حُضُورِهِ فَتَبَوَّأُوا فِي مَنْزِلِ الْإِحْسَانِ now these pious slaves, who, what, do they, what else do they do? They worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala atiqadi hudurihi. They worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they believe as if they are in his presence. فتبوأوا, so then they take up the manzi, في منزل الإحسان. They take up that level of al-ihsan. Why? Because we know when it comes to iman, there is al-islam, then there is, al there is al al muslim wal-mu'min wal-muhsin. Right, there is Islam wal Iman. Jalallahu fakrahu bayna ainehi. Jalallahu fakrahu bayna ainehi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put poverty right in front of him. Everywhere he looks, he will see poverty. He can be driving a brand new Merc. He can be living in a five bedroom house. He can have as many kids. The bank is full of money. He's got loads of land back home. He's got two, three, four businesses. But yet, he still has this hum, this, this want for the worldly life. Everywhere he looks, he still feels poor. There's no contentment. Right? Why? Because the dunya is his only goal. The dunya is his only goal. Now, when it comes to wealth and those type of things, what's the stance of a believer when it comes to wealth? Is, is it fine with a Muslim being wealthy? Is there anything wrong with it? Is it bad? Is it haram? Is it disliked? Being wealthy as a Muslim, there's nothing wrong with it. It comes down to how you perceive wealth. How you look at money and how you look at wealth. Some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, were really really rich Abdullah ibn Zubair radiyallahu anhu uh, Zubair ibn Awwam Adrhan ibn Awf Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu anhum jami'an a lot of the sahaba even in their later stages of life Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu they were really really wealthy but how does that make sense when they were so wealthy but yet they were so righteous right? how did they combine the two Ibn Qayyim rahimullah he talks about this and he says it was because of their view of wealth, how they viewed wealth and money. They saw themselves as caretakers of this wealth. They saw themselves as having 
part partial ownership. They didn't really own it. They knew that they were going to be asked about it on the day of judgment. So what did they do? They were wise in how they handled it. They were wise in how they handled it. They didn't see themselves as being the full right owners over it. They saw themselves as being people who were placed over this wealth and will be judged based on how they acted upon this wealth. So the dunya was in their hand. It was not in their heart. And that's how it should be for us. The dunya should not be in our heart. The dunya should be in our hand. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy. And it being a means through which we can have a easier life and provide for our children, provide for our parents, provide for our extended families, help the poor. There's nothing wrong with that. It's something that's considered to be um, praiseworthy. But if you are, are a person who their whole life, their only goal is the dunya, not the akhirah. And it keeps you up at night. And all you think about is wealth. And you forget about your salah. You forget about your ibadat. You, you try and seek and attain this wealth in any way possible. It doesn't matter if it's haram or halal. You just want to get it. This is a person who is destroyed. You're going down a destructive path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from that. So, the Shaykh rahimahullah, he ends it by saying, Ni'mal rafiqu li he says blessed is the companion who is seeking the path that leads towards khayrat and goodness that's the best type of companion we should all have and it's a type of companion we should all seek Right, A companion who when you meet them Reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala When you're around them if It reminds you of staying away from haramat You feel When you're around them You don't feel like you are Doing things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Will not be pleased with Right They encourage you to do good deeds It's an environment where you're you Somewhat may be both encouraging each other To be doing khair Right You're involved in that Which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pleased and you both encourage each other to stay away from the things that are haram. And that's the benefit of having good friends. They will have either a direct or indirect positive effect on you. And the opposite to that is what? Having bad friends. They will have either a direct or indirect effect on you, which is negative. And the peer pressure is real. Peer pressure is real. I mean, don't doubt it. Peer pressure was one of the things that caused Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet wasallam, to die upon disbelief. When he was on his deathbed, what happened? The Prophet ﷺ came to him. And he said, قُلْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ Say لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ A word that I can use on the day of judgment. يعني, some evidence that I can bring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there were the disbelievers of Quraysh around him. I think Safwan ibn Umayyah and some of the other ones were with him at that time. And they said to him, أَتَرْغَبُ عَمْ مِلَّةِ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ Are you turning away from the religion of your, of your father and your forefathers? So what did Abu Talib die upon? He said, ana ala, ana ala Muttalib. I die upon the religion of Abd al-Muttalib, which was shirk. Abu Talib knew the Prophet was a prophet. He knew he, the Quran was being revealed to him. He knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was sending him revelation. He protected him and aided him and helped him. But yet, he didn't become Muslim. Why? Because as we see towards the end of his life, peer pressure. The pressures of his environment. Right? And that's a reality. It can affect you, have a negative, a, a, a massive negative effect on you. You know, always think about your environment. Always think about your friends. Are they having a positive effect on me? Are they having a negative effect on me? If they're having a positive effect on you, then inshallah be with them and have a positive effect on them as well. If they're having a negative effect, effect on you, then see if you can have a positive effect on them. Otherwise, seek other friends. Why? Because... Don't be the one who is destroyed because of them. That's the reality. Your friends will be a reason or can be a reason which you can be destroyed. But the Prophet ﷺ said, That the person is on the religion of his friend. So look at the person you take as a friend. Look at the person you take as a friend. Allah barak fikum ikhwan. That was the end of uh, of the poem.